Dr. Glenn Patrick Doyle is a licensed psychologist with a particular interest and expertise in trauma, addiction, and self-help. Outside of his practice, he's been able to help thousands of people through the practical lessons and tools he shares in his published books, across his social media, at Dr. Doyle Says, and on his blog, Use Your Damn Skills, where he teaches us something about how to live our best lives. We wanted to have a conversation with him that cuts through the noise to bring you some practical advice for self-help and lasting recovery. Dr. Doyle, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, As we acknowledge Recovery Month, we also really wanted to cut through some of the noise and get down to some practical solutions that people can actually integrate into their lives. And so we're glad to have you contribute to this conversation. Um, Gosh, if your goal was to cut down on the noise and you came to me, I don't know who told you to come to me to cut down on noise. People who know me would say maybe it's more noise than not, but I'll do my best. Okay. (laughs) Can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about what you do? I can. Hi, guys. I'm Dr. Glenn Doyle. I am a uh, licensed psychologist. Um, So I'm a psychotherapist. Um, My my most of my work is with people who have serious post-traumatic and dissociative disorders. Usually people have had, um, you know, a really severe uh, childhood trauma uh, or attachment trauma growing up. Um, I also work uh, an awful lot with people who have addictions and I have, have a particular specialty with the, uh, that, that overlap, you know, people um, who have experienced a great deal of trauma and who, as part of what they're struggling with now, um, have gone on to develop kind of addictive patterns and and, and processes. So that's uh, you know that's that's the, the the bulk of work that I've done. I've worked uh, you know in hospitals, and uh, you know right now my my private practice you know specializes in the treatment of serious uh, uh, post traumatic and dissociative disorders. So I've worked I've worked in community mental health. I've been a case manager. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I've done a lot, but uh, you know, trauma is really kind of that that common thread that unites most of the work that I have done and that I do now. So I want to start by um, talking about what made you interested in psychology in the first place, and in particular, um, this focus of on trauma and addiction as a sort of result of trauma or related to trauma? Why that focus? Sure. Well, I got interested in psychology um, because uh, as a, a kid, I was desperately depressed. Um, you know, so my my background, like, like when I was a, a real little kid, um, you know, my dad was a, a, a an extraordinary guy. You know, he was a, a really intense personality and a really successful guy. Like, like he started businesses and and, and was a uh, kind of important figure in the community. And I have this memory of him as being this this really intense, charismatic guy. Um, he was also um, a, a really um, you know entrenched addict. You know, he mm-hmm. uh, his his drug of choice was. Well, at first, I, I thought his drug of choice was alcohol, um, and then you know later in life, I would learn that you know there were some polypharmacy issues, and then you know as well. But the point is that uh, you know I grew up kind of with that that hurricane of a man as 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 the center of my world. As a lot of people can probably tell you, when they grow up with a parent that is kind of a gale force winds it's really easy to develop a sense of inferiority. It's really easy to, uh, you know, to be a depressed kid. And I was, you know, I had, uh, you know, something that I didn't know at the time was that I also had ADHD, um, which was, uh, it made it extremely difficult to, uh, to, you know, follow through on things and get good grades. And so school was really tough. Like I, I was smart. I would do really well on those aptitude tests, like the Iowa tests of basic skills, like I get mm-hmm. really high scores. And then I wouldn't do my homework and I get terrible grades and I get yelled at for it. By the time I was uh, an adolescent, you know, my self-esteem had really been through the ringer. Um, you know, another thing that happened when I was a younger kid 
was, uh, you know, I was uh, sexually abused uh, by a friend of the family over the course of, of years. And, you know, that combination of things, you know, between the sexual abuse and the undiagnosed ADHD and, you know, kind of this, uh, you know, being in the household with a, a high functioning addict, right? They call him a high functioning addict because he never had a massive crash, right? He was still very successful. It all resulted in an adolescent, Glenn, you know, uh, being in a really, really difficult spot emotionally. And um, so I knew something had to to change. I didn't, you know, it, it, you know, a lot of people watching this might identify with this, but, um, you know, I was suicidal and yet I didn't want to die. So I developed a real interest in, um, at the time, self-help books and, and, and the self-help literature. And that's really kind of how I first became interested in psychology. I was still very depressed and I was still struggling with, with behavior patterns that, you know, now I can look back and, and see were kind of the beginning of addiction behaviors. Um, but I also had this uh, almost running parallel to that. I had this real interest in personal growth and self-help and, and, and personal development. So at the same time, when I was really miserable, I was developing kind of this working knowledge of, of the mental health field and the personal growth field and, and, and the research and, and whatnot. I was lucky enough to um, eventually um, hit upon uh, a body of work by uh, this guy named uh, Dr. David Burns and, and, and wrote a book titled Feeling Good which is, I think, the cheesiest self-help title that you can possibly imagine. But what it is, is, is a self-help book all about what's called cognitive therapy, which um, you know, is, um, as it turns out, one of the more empirically um, supported treatments for depression. And that's actually what got me thinking about studying psychology seriously, like as a career, because I know that I'm not the only one to have the experience that I had, you know, like I know I'm not the only one to grow up with undiagnosed, untreated ADHD. Like I know I'm not the only one who, you know, I'm certainly not the only, um, you know, sexual abuse survivor out there. Right. So I had the thought that, man, I was really lucky. And so far as I stumbled upon this book, there are some people who are not going to stumble upon that book. There are some people who are not going to stumble upon whatever book they need. So if I can devote my career to kind of helping people discover that thing, that idea, you know, that 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 moment, that breakthrough, whatever you want to call it, then maybe that's a meaningful thing. So that's the long answer to the short question. How'd you get into psychology? <laughs> uh, no, that's really cool. Like I wanted to know about the book. Was it about concepts that were explained to you in a certain way? Was it about like tools or like actual steps that you should take that lead to a change? What was it that kind of was that first thing that started to help? All of the above. The thing that really made the difference was that cognitive therapy is a very straightforward model of how people get sick and how people get well. Um, you know, if you get into psychology, in my field, um, you're going to find that that there are some um, well, there are endless theories about why people are unhappy and how people can be happier. Some of which really get into the weeds, right? And 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 they're really interesting theories. Like I think you know Freudian psychoanalysis is a really interesting body of theory. It's not the most accessible theory to somebody who is suffering. What made the difference with um, this book by David Burns? Um, is that you know cognitive therapy was presented as a departure from this idea that you know man we really don't know like there's this there's this idea in kind of old school psychology if you know you really don't know why you do what you do you're it's in the unconscious right like like you know we're all mysteries to ourselves but what the originators of cognitive therapy um, thought was that you know boy are we really mysteries to ourselves I don't know. It seems that if we kind of delve into what we're thinking and what we believe, you know, why we do what we do and why we feel what we feel may not be all that complicated, right? The idea that, man, when we're depressed or anxious or, or you know, struggling with a trauma issue, 
usually what's happening is we're operating on thoughts and beliefs that are often distorted. And what I mean when they're distorted is, you know, man, victims of abuse, for example, very often have this belief about themselves that we are less than, right? What's wrong with us that we were chosen to be abused? Like it's a very common belief. It's definitely a belief that I had. I definitely had a belief um, to the tune of man, you know, everyone says I'm smart and yet I don't get good grades. What's wrong with me? You know, why am I so bad, right? Now I say those things out loud and it's pretty easy to say, well, that's a distorted belief, right? There's nothing wrong with you. That's something that you came to believe through repeated experiences, right? And you didn't have kind of the support and the guidance in your early life to correct those beliefs, right? Like you didn't have the person around you to say, no, 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 look, like, like don't, this isn't about you, right? The abuse was not about you. You know, you're struggling with, with executive functioning is not about you. That's the ADHD or, or whatever. So this idea that cognitive therapy has that, you know, look, we do develop distorted beliefs about ourselves that causes us to think distorted thoughts about ourselves and that we can actually go in and become aware of how our thoughts and beliefs are distorted and we can actually respond to that in a way that's more realistic and more compassionate now that was just revolutionary for me but it also offered really practical tools to become aware of of when our thinking was distorted and what you know what to actually do about it like it, it literally offered um you know, for example, scripts of how to talk to yourself. Because I got to tell you, like, like back in the day, I would think, like someone would say self-talk to me. And I'd be like, oh, so lame. This idea of self-talk, when I'm going to talk to myself, come on. As it turns out, we're talking to ourselves all the time. We're talking right. to ourselves anyway, all the time anyway, right? And what this book suggested was that, man, if we could become aware of how we're talking to ourselves, especially the the, you know, the 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 stuff that we're kind of laying on ourselves that's not that's not true and if we can talk to ourselves intentionally in a different kind of way you've talked about how your philosophies and approaches to therapy and your ideas around self-help have been shaped by those that have worked in practice for you. What were some of the challenges that you faced uh, after kind of coming through adolescence um, uh, struggling with depression and ADHD and trying to help yourself. Feeling Good by by David Burns was kind of the catalyst of, you know, man, maybe not just maybe there's a new career out there for me, but there's a different way to live. And it made me really aware of, you know, how information processing, like how we think about ourselves, what we say to ourselves, kind of how we... Um, how we experience the world and what we do in response. As I say, it didn't solve every problem I had, and 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 no book will, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Um, despite what it might say on the cover, no book will actually solve every unless it's my books, in which case, <laughs> in which case they're really not going to solve every problem. <laughs> um, it's now a good time yeah. to plug those, by the way. <laughs> the books are called. <laughs> I've got two of them. One, uh, one is called. Uh, they're they're both available on the Kindle store. Um, and one is called um, "Wish I'd Known That," and it's kind of you know lessons that I'm like, boy, as I was coming up, I really wish someone had told me these things. Uh, and then the other one is called uh, "Just Just So You Know," just things, just so you know for your journey, just so you know. So just so you know, and wish I'd known that they're available on the the Kindle store, but um. But I was kidding when I said they'll solve every problem. They really won't solve every problem because no book will. Um, I was still, you know, very depressed. I was still really struggling with with addiction patterns. Now, this is one of the things that I really, really learned on my journey was that we actually don't get to this place. You know, spoiler alert. You know, we actually don't get to this place where we are invulnerable to to triggers. You know, if, if you follow my my social media content, you know you see that I, I I pay a great deal of attention to man. Wherever you are in your recovery today, don't relapse today. 
you know, today there is a danger, you know, no, no matter how stable or safe you might be, there's a danger of, of relapse. And I think we have to keep that in the front of, of our minds at all times. So even after kind of that, that paradigm shift for me of discovering David Burns and cognitive therapy, um, it was still a real tug of war. In fact, it even got more intense um, as, as I got into college. Um, because you know, gosh, at that point, you know, you are uh, you're you're a grown up, right? You're out of the house. You know, you're you're out in the world. You have, as it turns out, lots more opportunities to do lots more destructive stuff than perhaps when you were living at home. At least that's what I found. Um, I actually went to college. I started college um, again, deeply depressed. Kind of with that glimmer of hope, um, you know, from from having stumbled across David Burns and other authors too. Like like I had also um, um, found. I, I think this was my freshman year of college. I had stumbled upon the work of a psychologist named Nathaniel Brandon, who was one of the first guys to really write about self esteem. Mm. And you know, his whole theory, just just briefly, like like his whole theory revolves around how look, self esteem is not something that you have like it's not something that you know you have x amount of self-esteem it's an experience of yourself that you create and the biggest factor in creating the experience of high self-esteem is living your life consciously on purpose not going on autopilot right it was kind of then that uh, reading nathaniel brandon's work that i first realized how important it was to deal with a with the symptom of dissociation <laughs> like a lot of times uh, you know folks who uh you know are, are highly dissociative they're like boy i don't i don't understand why i should have to give this up it kind of works for me because it keeps me at a distance from these terrible memories and these terrible feelings but if we're going to create a an experience of a really engaged purposeful high self-esteem life you know, it's really hard to do that and to keep going on autopilot, i.e., like when we're dissociating all the time. But the point is, um, even though I had kind of these glimmers of hope and these kind of seeds of interesting ideas, see, I'm a big believer in um, kind of planting seeds. And that's what I do with my social media presence. You know, like each tweet that I put out is like that. My, I'm just thinking, look, I'm going to plant this seed somewhere. And it might change somebody's life. It might not change somebody's life. But even if I just plant that seed for it to begin to just kind of sprout. The reason I do that is because that's what happened with me. Like I would read these books, a little seed would get planted. And maybe I wouldn't do anything with that for a few years, but it would eventually kind of come around. I'd started uh, college as a music major. I, I figured I was going to be a rock and roll star. Okay. <laughs> You know, and, and the reason I was going to be a rock and roll star was because I, I was way into the music of Billy Joel. And I read an interview with Billy Joel and he's like, man, I learned to play the piano. These girls would like me. And then dude married a supermodel. I'm like, you know what? I want that deal. I want the deal where I marry a supermodel. <laughs> and then I have a job where, you know, thousands of people stand up and say, yay, at the end of it. You know, I play a show and they say, yeah, I want that, that deal. <laughs> Um, as it turns out, um, I was a, a, a little too depressed to, to basically even make it to class. Um, you know, I really crashed and burned in my freshman year of college. I kind of had to go home with my tail between my legs because, because that's what you want to do. If you're desperately depressed, you want to go back to the scene of the chaos that really helps. Um, and at that time, I really returned to a lot of the uh, the stuff that that I had started reading that had been working, mm -hmm. and 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 I really really dived into the um, the David Byrne stuff. I really really dived into that Nathaniel Brandon stuff, and I developed a a different perspective on healing and recovery that has really been the game changer as far as I'm concerned. With you know you know to this day maintaining my my recovery and it's not the case that man I, I i turned it around and it's been smooth sailing ever since especially with the addiction patterns um, but it is the case that you know man once you make the the shift from thinking in terms of when will i heal to how can i recover right so i kind of what i did was i kind of blended the treatment approach of of you know, cognitive therapy for depression, which again, it's 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 very different from 
kind of the traditional, what we think of as like the traditional psychoanalytic um, approach to therapy. Like you think of psychoanalysis and you think of, you know, yeah, you're going to come in and you're going to lay down on a couch and you're going to kind right. of free associate and you know, the therapist is going to make interpretations and you're going to have your breakthrough moment. You're going to have your aha moment and nothing will ever be the same. I wish it worked like that. By the way, I totally wish it worked like that. Cognitive therapy is a different approach. It, it emphasizes education and tools and skills. It, 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 it emphasizes what you do, especially outside of the session, where psychoanalysis emphasizes what happens in the session. Cognitive therapy is about like, look, we're developing skills that you can take out there. So I blended that approach with the idea of the 12-step tradition. Um, because by this point, I was crystal clear on the fact that, boy, I have some very marked addictive tendencies um, you know, that were very similar to my father's. You know, I mean, I'm sure part of it was in the genetics, and I'm sure part of it was kind of learned and you know, what I saw growing up. But I realized that you know, if this was going to work, like if changing my life meaningfully and, and sustainably was going to work, it was going to have to include an element of that addiction psychology, that addiction recovery. The thing that I like about the 12-step tradition, and, and, and there are lots of perspectives on 12-step, you know, there are lots of people with very strong feelings, you know, both pro and, 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 and con with the 12-step tradition. Um, so, you know, I, it's important to say, look, it's, I'm not a pure 12-step guy, but one of the things that I love about it is that it starts out with, and in step one, it says, look, we have to radically accept that we are powerless over this thing. Right. And if we get it in our head that eh, maybe we can handle it, eh, maybe, maybe I'm in charge. No, we're done. We're done. Yeah. We have to wake up every single day and 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 remind ourselves, you know, look, my first priority has to be doing what I, I can do today. Right. So between blending that 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 12 step model of recovery, not healing, recovery with kind of the the proactive skills and tools of the cognitive therapy approach. And, and nowadays, as a therapist, I bring in like lots of other you know, tools and stuff. But that really kind of set me on, on a different trajectory. And the result of that trajectory was I went back to school. Um, I burned right through a, like I had to start over. I had no usable credits from, from my disaster year. Um, but I did a four year, I, I did a, they, this is, you know, when, when you get a trauma survivor who is really motivated, like, like you often find this to be the case, you know, we can accomplish amazing things, right? Like a trauma survivor who is, who is really depressed can be, you know, you know, really, really inert. A trauma survivor who is really motivated and a little bit angry can do amazing things. So I burned through a four year degree in three years. I did my undergraduate, like I had to start over, did my, in three years. Got accepted to graduate school and and kind of that brings you know that sent me on this this trajectory to being a psychologist and and to being a therapist. For a lot of people, when they hear PTSD, or let me say historically, um yeah. people can often they think about like soldiers who are exposed to trauma on the battlefield or more extreme um forms of shock and violence. And now the discourse and the conversation includes like broader concepts of trauma, um, things such as complex trauma, childhood trauma, intergenerational trauma, uh, medical trauma, and the impacts of things like all forms of abuse, which you've mentioned, community violence, racism and hate, uh, even displacement and other, and other um, experiences. So my question is, what exactly is trauma? And are we overusing the term now and overdiagnosing PTSD in some cases, or are we actually uh, beginning to understand it better? So that's a, that's that's a favorite question on on social media of of, of whether the, the I didn't know the that word, by the way <laughs> the, the the word trauma that I, I swear to God like that's 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 a constant conversation about whether we are overusing trauma just like i'm overusing air quotes today <laughs> um no so jumping to that part of the question just because it's it, it kind of wraps around the other parts of the question yeah. um i very much feel that that <sighs> the fact that some people um use the word trauma in a way that other people um disagree with 
doesn't equate to where we're over diagnosing or, or misdiagnosing trauma. And it's really important to remember too, that, that discussions about trauma in the zeitgeist don't always add up to diagnoses. Right. Um, I feel about trauma the same way I feel about ADHD. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you hear a lot of people talk about how ADHD is, is, is overdiagnosed I try not to do air quotes. It's overdiagnosed. <laughs> That's what they say. Um, it's my experience that ADHD is massively uh, underdiagnosed. There are lots and lots of, you know, not just kids, but adults who really struggle with attentional issues um, that, that meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD and would be really helped by proper ADHD um, um, treatment. That will never get it because it's not even on their radar screen because our culture doesn't put it on their radar screen. And trauma is 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 much the same way. And it goes to how you how you even began kind of a you know the question like you know man, we started you know the the recent cultural recognition of trauma and and when I say recent I'm meaning in the last you know five or six decades um, kind of in Western culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and when we start using the word trauma in the context of post-traumatic disorder, um, you know, sure, like like it comes from this this idea of of shock and violence and, and shell shock and, and and war trauma and and whatnot, but that sets us up for a particular bias when we think about trauma. The truth about trauma. And this is from my perspective. Look, I mean, if you line any 10 trauma specialists up, you will get a different answer from each of us. I'm right? sure you'd, yeah. get, you'd probably even get different answers from like my, you you'd probably even get different answers from like my mentors and in the trauma field. You'd probably get different answers from my students, honestly. But as far as I'm concerned, when we talk about trauma, we are talking about an experience that overwhelmed our ability to cope. Um, and it's really, really difficult to um to um I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It's really difficult to quantify that because there, there's no way to say, boy, this experience that overwhelmed this person's ability to cope, why didn't it overwhelm that person? Mm-hmm. Right. So it must not be an inherently traumatic thing because this person wasn't overwhelmed, but this person was. Right. In my experience, those conversations really miss the point. Right. The point is we have a suffering person over here whose ability to cope was overwhelmed. They were traumatized. I could see the argument for like, boy, we're, we're throwing the word around too much. But honestly, I'm not terribly interested in that argument because I'll be honest, I have never, I've never had somebody come seeking my help as a trauma specialist say, you know, and, and throwing the word around trauma and, and, and throwing the word trauma around and me have the thought, hmm, I don't know. I think maybe they just need to suck it up. I've never had that experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you what experience I have way more often is somebody will come in and say, Who? So I had, I, I, I don't know, I, I think I might have, you know, some trauma stuff to work through, but I really don't know. I, other people had it worse. I don't know. Other people had it worse. And then was this really trauma? I'm like, All right. So what happened to you? And then they will relate awful things, like terrible things that clearly affected them, right? I said, boy, I mean, it sure sounds as if you've experienced some trauma. No, it's not trauma. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm clearly fine. What I'm trying to say is, is in my experience, the denial of trauma, just like the denial of, of, of ADHD, is a much bigger problem in our culture. It's much easier and much more useful to say, you know, not was this thing traumatizing, but rather to say, is this person experiencing a trauma response? That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, you also differentiate between the words healing and recovery. And I noticed that you did so earlier in our conversation. Can you explain um, what, how and why you choose to differentiate those words? You bet. Because I, I think it's a really, really important thing for, for realistic, sustainable um, recovery. The reason why why I differentiate between healing and and recovery is because I, I can I can thank self help for that. 
um, not just self-help books, but um, but also, uh, I mean, at least recently, internet accounts who talk about healing. And they talk about, you know, you know healing is possible. We hear this a lot. Healing is possible. You know, do, 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 we got to heal from our trauma. And I look at that and I'm like, hmm, healing... Uh, that the, the the word itself speaks to um, kind of a physiological process in my mind. Like when I think healing, I think of like you know a, a bone that that is mending, right? Or a or a, a scab, whatever. It's healing, right? And then you know when it's healed when the scab falls out, etc. But I don't know about you. Like I've broken a couple bones in in my lifetime. Um, it's my experience that. I didn't have a whole lot to do with the rate at which those bones mended. You know, it's my experience that I don't have a whole lot to do with how fast that scab falls off. I guess we can do things that 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 prolong our our healing, right? Like we can pick up a scab, or we can make it worse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we can make it worse. But it's always maddening to me when when you know folks talk about healing because it it feels like a process that um, is is in some ways necessarily passive. It's not really in our control. And look, your mileage may vary. You know, the, the, there may be some people who hear the word healing and get really moved and excited and and whatever. It's never spoken to me. Um, it's also the case that that I've um, you know worked with so many people who are terribly frustrated that they're not healing faster. Um, and they say, boy, I can't wait for my brain to heal. But that's, you know, even that language is like, you know, we got to wait for our brain to heal. And it's enormously frustrating. And it makes us kind of this, this, this passive agent in the entire process. Whereas what really helped me, even going back to when I, you know, kind of had my aha moments, um, you know, after I dropped out of college, um, you know, this idea that, you know, like healing is going to take the time it takes. Um, some people are going to heal faster. Some people are going to heal slower. What are you going to do? Some people are environments that, that promote healing. What can we do? We can't really impact directly with, with all that much specificity healing. We can affect recovery. And recovery, when I say recovery, I'm talking about the daily rituals the daily um, skills, the daily tools, you know, the, the you know the habits. You know, I'm talking about working a recovery program in 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 the in the language of of twelve step, because I find when, you know, especially with my trauma patients, you know, when we change the the perspective from boy, you know, therapy is a place where you come to to kind of be held while you wait to heal which is kind of the traditional view in some people's minds of, of therapy, as opposed to therapy is a place where you come to learn skills and tools and, and get support to recover. Boy, that really changes the game. That makes you an active agent in all of this. Like you may not be able to necessarily speed up your healing, but man, you can, um, you know, you can work a recovery program. And guess what? Healing tends to happen faster when you're working a program, when you're, you know, actively involved in in recovery. As you work a recovery program from either addiction or especially trauma, it's really important to wake up every day and remind yourself, okay, what am I doing here? Like, what are my goals? What realistically am I going to do in this 24 hours, right? How are my workouts today, my emotional workouts, my, you know, my spiritual workouts? You know, how is that going to build upon what I did yesterday? And how is this all going to build upon what me and my coach, therapist, sponsor, whatever? Like, how is that going to build on what we've decided is important at what I and what I need to work on? There's such a difference between working a recovery program and um, the experience that some people have that I hate for them. You know, some people have this experience where, you know, man, they are drowning. Like they're out there in the fight, they're drowning. And they have like this one hour of week that they go into their therapist. And sure, it's nice, right? Like it's it's nice to hang out with somebody who understands you and 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 you know doesn't judge you and and and, and that's fantastic. 
But then they're right, they're back out in the fight without a clear idea of, okay, I'm going to do this today. These are my goals today. We're working on this. We're building on this, et cetera, et cetera. What are some of your best survival tactics for people experiencing an immensely stressful period? And I frame it that way because it's like, maybe they don't have, I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't have a long-term sort of mental health challenge that needs to be addressed. Um, but just like, what are, what can they do? Um, even if they don't have that one hour session for somebody to kind of coach them through it. Big time. And, and, you know, you, you hit upon a really important piece of the puzzle there when you emphasize the fact that, look, uh, struggling may or may not have anything to do with the diagnosis you ever receive. Um, struggling may or may not, you know, recovery may or may not have anything to do with a therapist. Um, you know, I'm super realistic about the fact that, look, there are lots of people out there who will not have access to good therapy. So first things first, let's get out of this idea that, that you know, we're talking about diagnoses and, and necessarily therapy relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're struggling, you are struggling. Um, let's even get away from this uh, the idea of like, you know, like this can't be an addiction because it's not a drug. Let's get away from that. If you are struggling with an addictive pattern, you are struggling with an addiction pattern. All right. So first things first is getting super, super real. We, we can't, you know, it's, it's, it's an old Nathaniel Brandon quote when he says, look, you can't change a truth, the reality of which you deny. Right. And it's, again, it's one of the reasons why step one is step one in the 12 step tradition. I think my most helpful tip for for a lot of people was certainly you know the, the thing that helped me the most and the thing that still helps me the most is deal with this 24 hours okay one of the things that i find most destructive that so many people do and unfortunately so many uh kind of coaches and therapists encourage they bite off more than they need to chew it's not even a matter of like more than they can chew it's more than they need to chew because I'll tell you something, if I'm struggling right here and now, I don't have to figure out the next 10 years of my life, which is good news because I can't, right? Yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm gonna live another 10 years. I don't know if I'm gonna live another 10 minutes, honestly. Right? All I know is that I have to cope with what I have to cope with today. I have both the struggles and the resources that I have right now. So I say, bring it into, like I say, 24 hours. I mean, really, you could take it down to like the 60 seconds. Like, okay, I'm, I'm not going to allow myself to, to, to get freaked out about how am I going to solve these big picture problems, right? Like there's a time and a place to, to think about solving those big picture problems. But when you're struggling, when you're in the shit, when you're in the fight, when you're in the storm, no, no, no. Worry about surviving this 24 hours. We think in terms of questions and answers. Um, we, we can't not ask questions and provide answers in our own head. So right now, I'm asking and answering questions of myself. Like I'm asking myself, hmm, what words can I use in what order right. that, will, that will illustrate this point, right? What gestures can I use? Et cetera, et cetera. Right now you're asking and answering questions in your head. You're going, hmm, like, does this make sense? Is this relevant to the question I asked? I mean, you know, boy, like, should, should I move on? Should I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We can't not ask and answer questions. As it turns out, the questions that we ask have a lot to do with the answers that we get. Because our brain will absolutely answer any question you give it, really will, whether or not it has the information to do so. <laughs> Right. It's my experience that a lot of times when we are struggling, we are asking questions that um, are often not, um, uh, which is not terribly helpful. And again, it's not our fault. Like a lot of times when we get into this therapy stuff, you know, some people will think, oh man, I'm doing this thing. It must be my fault. No, it's not your fault. Like you're responding to your condition. Right. All right. Like, like so this isn't like, a, ah, quit hitting yourself. Like, no, that's not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is on a practical level, man, I'm trying to survive this 24 hours. What questions can I ask that are really useful in helping me survive this 24 hours? That itself is a question, right? And it's a more helpful question than, ugh, what am I going to do when I don't survive this 24 hours? Ugh. 
like, you know, like, man, why does everything suck? Right. Yeah. Your, your brain will tell you. <laughs> And usually, especially when we're struggling with trauma, our brain will furnish answers to the tune of, well, it sucks because you, you know, like, oh, you, you asked for your abuse and, and, and you can't get good grades and, 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 you know, you, you can't handle life. Like your brain will give you answers. Again, they're, they're BS belief systems. They're just BS. But, you know, they'll give you answers. If I ask a different question, though, I'll say, okay, and this, in 10 minutes what can i do in this 10 minutes to uh to stay safe for example what can i do in this 10 minutes or this hour whatever you know like, like what can i do to feel one percent better what can i do this hour to make it one percent less likely that i'll do my 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 um, drug or behavior of addiction right like so not how can i guarantee that i won't do it because our brain doesn't do well with that either. Like our brain doesn't do well with don't do a thing. Like right now, don't think of a pink elephant. Don't do it. Don't think of a pink. I told Too you late. not to. <laughs> Our brain doesn't do well with that, right? Yeah. Our brain does a little better with what can I do concretely, realistically, this next hour to make it 1% less likely that I'll do that thing that I'm trying to not do, Right. Um, usually if you can think to ask a helpful question, usually your brain will play ball with you say, well, look, if you're really serious about like, like making it a little less likely that you'll do the thing, maybe you do this and this and this, you know, I want to just kind of wrap up the conversation, um, building on what we were talking about, about how not everybody is going to have access to like traditional therapy and maybe, yeah. I mean, for better or worse, right? Not everybody needs necessarily that sort of format um, of care. But lately, self-help and self-care um, have become these like buzzwords and hot topics on social media uh, wow. with trends uh, kind of spreading on platforms like TikTok and Instagram. What do you think are the potential benefits or the potential dangers of taking advice uh, from content creators and influencers who are not always licensed psychologists, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have, you know, something that's useful for somebody to put into action in their lives. And oh, on that note, what is ethical self-help in that sense? Because I know that that's something you really care about too. You bet. So, um, I, and, and Lord knows it didn't start with, TikTok and and, and <laughs> Instagram. Um, the reason I feel so strongly about it, as 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 I explained before, is because self help I, I think literally saved my life. I became involved with an organization called Seek Safely, um, and it's 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 an organization that I'm I've been on the board. I'm now board president of of Seek Safely, but it was founded by the family of people who had been harmed by um self-help uh influencers um who uh you know self-help has turned into a you know a multi-billion dollar industry and this goes way beyond tiktok like uh, it's 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 been a multi-billion dollar industry um because self-help influencers you know they know full well that there are lots of people that for for whatever reason either don't have access or um, are, are are they're either unable or or, or uninterested, unwilling um, to 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 chase down traditional therapy. And by the way, I get that that the the mental health uh, industry and mental health delivery systems in our culture we have huge problems. So I'm never going to give anyone a hard time for chasing down self help resources. Again, that's where I got started. Right. right? Um. The question of, of, of what is ethical self-help, and at Seek Safe, we talk a lot about ethical and accountable self-help. Um, it really comes down to the influencer um, acknowledging the limits of, of both what they know, what they can do, but also the applicability of their material. So if you remember a few minutes ago, I'm here saying, you know, look, I, I have my approach 
and I have my definition of trauma and I have, you know, the stuff that worked for me and the stuff that I teach in no universe. Am I ever going to say that this is applicable to 100% of everybody even watching this, let alone in the world, right? That's me acknowledging that I come from a very specific perspective and, and, you know, I have stuff that's helpful for a specific, you know, subset of people. I can't even tell you necessarily what subset of people are going to be helped by my stuff because I haven't met them all. Right. Right. Mm. Where you come, where, where you uh, see the red flags are, are self-help influencers. Um, and by the way, like this could be, there are plenty of self-help influencers who are therapists, you know, who are licensed professionals, right? Um, and then there are plenty who are not. But the problem is when you see anybody advertising their material as universally applicable and oftentimes they they it comes with a spiel about how um oh that 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 they derived this this material from kind of essential truths about the universe i think it's really telling that you know in the 12 step tradition they do speak of a higher power but they never speak of a higher power as the higher power says do this <laughs> right right so in my experience the people who are able to use self-help really effectively and really safely you know, really don't uh, get sucked into the cult of personality of a teacher, but they get really interested in kind of the, the, the teachings and the tools. And usually they, they have cobbled together kind of a toolbox that includes stuff from multiple teachers and multiple traditions, right? Now, th this is a double-edged sword because you know somebody could rightly say, well, look, Dr. Doyle, a big part of your shtick is your own story. Like I use a lot of my own experiences, right? But here's the thing. I use them, I use my own experiences specifically to place limits on the applicability of my material, right? Like I use my own story and, and whatever my own personality and whatever to say, look, this is how I know it doesn't work for everybody. Right. Right. But this is how it worked for me. You bet. You bet. Yeah. In terms of, of ethical self-help, just, just to wrap it up real, real quickly, um, Seek Safely has um, what we call the Seek Safely Promise. And what it is is a, a series of, of pledges um, that we ask, we invite self-help teachers to take. And they can go to, to our website at seeksafely.org. And, and it's under the tab that says Make a Promise. It's the Seek Safely Promise. Um, and if you look at the principles of the Seek Safely Promise, what they really are are the bare minimum commitments that any self-help teacher should make um, before being in business. They're things like, I will acknowledge the, uh, the limits of my expertise. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I will um, acknowledge the risks involved in, in you know, anything that I'm teaching or any event that I do, whatever. It's, you know, I like to say it's it's the self-help equivalent of, you know, just asking somebody to please wear underwear before they leave the house. Like it's not, you know, um, it's the bare minimum of, of, of kind of ethics and responsibility. Because we got to be honest, like I know that because doctor is in front of my name and I know, you know, because I have whatever certain amount, social media followers and whatnot. Like, sure, I have a megaphone that some people don't. And that means I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to, uh, you know, when I put things out, really acknowledge their limitations and the potential harm they could do. You have to take that seriously and, and not get kind of carried away with kind of the, the likes and the shares and the cachet of being a, a, a social media influencer. I, I still question about, you know, people say I'm a, I'm a mental health influencer. I'm like, I can't even influence my cat. My cat is napping. It'd be really cute if she sat right here on her cat tree. Like that would be really great. But I can't even influence her. But I'm sure you've influenced a few people today and probably gained a few more followers. So thank you so much. <laughs> this was um, really helpful and enlightening. And I think, you know, self-help as a space overall can be just a little bit overwhelming because it is so saturated. So it's great for people to have some tools. And I think if I'm hearing you correctly, it's safe to say that it's really about whatever like feels like it has a practical application for your own life, for your own experience, um, and not taking anything as universal truth. So right. thank you. Thank you so much for the conversation. 
course. Thanks for watching In Recovery with Tony's House. Tony's House provides a safe living environment and a supportive community for people in transition, helping them heal, reconnect with children and family, and develop the skills needed for a healthy and fulfilled life. You can support Tony's House by visiting tonyshouse.org backslash donate and by clicking the subscribe button for more informative content and inspiring stories.